another Thank much. Yeah. By the way, Classical Theist, Pines App, uh, and Spexo all here. Uh, and I'm going to kind of let them uh, MC things. I've been talking so much all day anyway. Uh, but this is the uh, Ghosts and Exorcisms uh, segment here. Uh, so welcome to the program, the one-year anniversary, Cozy Friend Fest 2022. Thank both of you gentlemen for being here, and I'm just going to let you talk for a minute. Is that cool? Awesome. Yeah. All right. Uh, all right. Thank you all for having hey. us. It's uh, an up? honor to be here. It's classical these there. Hey, what's up? Yeah. Um, Awesome. All right. Yeah. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, happy anniversary to Cozy. It's uh, awesome to be um, able to stream on this platform. Uh, thanks to Nick Fuentes. Thanks to uh, everybody else making great content. Thank you, Ralph, for doing the stream. Um, yeah. So we're going to talk about uh, ghosts and exorcisms from, I guess, a Catholic theological position. Um, I am like the least knowledgeable person here. So I kind of just wrote a bunch of bullet points and then they're going to kind of uh, jump in and uh, correct me if I'm wrong and go into other stuff. So I guess we'll first start with ghosts and how Catholics view ghosts. Um, basically, ghost comes from the German word geist, which means spirit, and polter means rumble. So when you say poltergeist, it's basically rumbling spirit. And the Catholic theological view of ghost is there's really no specific dogma or doctrine that we are required to believe about ghosts. Um, but what we don't believe is that it's just like spirits being in the physical world. We don't believe that they are just like lost or whatever. There's only three places that they could be, which we'll get to. But basically what the, the common theological thought behind ghosts in the Catholic um, theology is that they are manifestations of spirits that are either um, in purgatory, hell, or heaven. And the manifestations are like, we can see them, but they're not actually there. They, we believe that God allows them to communicate with us for certain reasons or something like that. And they're not demons. It's different than uh, demons. Um, and also ghosts are biblical. We have uh, Saul going to Endor to call upon the ghost of the prophet Samuel. We have Judas uh, Maccabeus. Um, he met the ghost of the high priest uh, Anonius or Anius in a vision. Um, and uh, like I said, there are three types of ghosts. And we believe like God may allow people in purgatory to manifest themselves and appear to us in order to ask for prayers or if somebody is in hell and they manifest it may be God trying to warn us to change our lives so that we don't end up like them or of course maybe we'll, we'll see like an apparition of saints or something along those lines and that would be basically the general uh, idea of how Catholics view ghosts um, Pine Sap or Classical Deist anything you want to add to that? Yeah, so I, I think kind of the general um, like culture of ghosts trends towards almost your kind of like late 1900s kind of like spiritualism movements yeah. where, you know, there was, there was like the, the conjuring circles that they would have. They would have like the, um, Oh my goodness. I think, I think CT knows what I'm talking about. Like they would all sit around a table. They'd hold hands together. Um, I, I can't remember. Would it be a conjuring or would there be a different, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Something like that. And, and it was very, very popular. In fact, um, especially amongst the kind of like high class elite in like America and stuff like that, you know, people do it all the time. Um, it, it was it was almost this kind of like uh, like faux spirituality of like, oh, we know there's something beyond the pale, but we don't really know what it is. And these and we interact with these spirits. Um, but the Catholic view has always been that you know, ghosts, as, as, uh, Spexo said, are in a particular location. That's not the physical world. No one is like left behind. No one dies and their soul is like left to this mortal coil. It, it they're, they're in some other place. Um, a good example is I, I can't remember the saint who was a sister who, who had Pope Innocent the third appear to her, but Pope Innocent the third was in purgatory and it actually appeared to the sister, this religious sister and said, um, sister, I'm in purgatory. Can you please pray for me so that I may get to heaven quicker? And she said, Oh yeah, of course. And so like her and the other sisters for, I think it was like a week, like prayed consistently. And then I believe he appeared to her again. He, this time he was in paradise. He was like, thank you. Like, you know, you don't know how much the prayers for souls in purgatory, like, go far and so it was such a like beautiful story to hear about like the the ghost of pope innocent the third like appearing to her to ask for some like prayer on his behalf yeah i mean there's it should be reiterated that like there's a kind of a wide variety of acceptable positions to hold as a catholic uh with respect to you know ghosts so you know i, I think one of the unfortunate things that 
uh, maybe a lot of secular people who have like a predilection towards um say the praetor natural or or whatever one of the unfortunate things that they might seem to have to like feel like they have to sacrifice if they're going to become christian is to basically believe that all of the experiences that that they might have had just have to be attributable to the, the demonic whereas a catholic can kind of say well that's not necessarily true there's we, we should certainly be um we, we should always be cautious about this like we, I, I think it's always a mistake to if you like encounter some sort of um, like paranormal encounter with what you think is a ghost and not to pursue that because it could it could very easily be um, the demonic making some kind of a manifestation to get you off the track of salvation. But on the other hand, St. Thomas Aquinas does say pretty emphatically that it actually, to some extent disagreeing with Augustine that, um, yeah, he actually thinks it would be absurd to think that the souls that are departed from their bodies are just stuck in their abode. Like they, they, it, it makes all the sense in the world to think that they could make their presence manifest on the earth for various reasons. You know, even the damned God will allow to manifest their presence mm-hmm. on earth, you know, for the sake of, either intimidating the faithful or um, just, I think, showing the uh, grave unhappiness that comes with the state of being eternally lost. So even the damned can make a presence on the earth. Uh, the saints, St. Saint Thomas says, like, they can come and go as they please, actually. Like, um, of course, they will always do everything in accordance with the will of God, but they are able to uh, manifest their brilliance uh, on the earth at will. Um, and I heard... Oh, good. Yeah, and then, and then of course the souls in purgatory. The souls in purgatory, I think, are probably, I would say that most ghost stories are either attributable to demons or the souls of, in purgatory making some form of plea for help. And there's actually a very interesting uh, museum in Rome. I think it's called the Museum of the Holy Souls in Purgatory, and it's basically like a a, a, a museum that. That, that collects all kinds of physical evidence of um, departed souls making manifest some kind of message that has to do with the plea for, for prayer. Um, and, and I would encourage everyone to like look into that because it's actually kind of interesting. Um, there, there is so, – so I, I guess long story short, I, I guess I would just say that, you know, for something that is such a human universal – such as, um, you know, ghost stories and such, uh, the church is able to accommodate that, but it is within a certain framework that I think has to be understood. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was, uh, oh, go ahead. oh, go ahead, Spek. So sorry. Uh, no, I was just going to say that that's also uh, what I read too, is that the overwhelming majority of like encounters with ghosts uh, are believed to be souls in purgatory that are begging to uh, be prayed for or whatever. Because yeah, so and that just makes pre- sense. Cause like, well, why, why would a saint just be <laughs> making mm-hmm. like these weird, bizarre, like moans in the air or mm-hmm. whatever? Like that would yeah, make yeah. any sense. Uh, um, so, so it's, it's usually either like a, a purgatory or the damned. Mm-hmm. And I also heard that like, no matter what manifestation you see, Um, you should, you should, the best thing you can do is just to pray for that soul. Um, you know, even it's likely if you're seeing a manifestation that you didn't conjure up or whatever, uh, it's likely that it's because God was allowing it to manifest to you and it wouldn't necessarily be demonic or Satanistic if you like tried to communicate with them, but your best case scenario is to just pray for that soul. Um, and also this kind of manifestation is not the same thing as what's condemned, um, where uh, which is necromancy, which is trying to intentionally conjure up spirits right. through through like Ouija boards or seances and stuff like that. That is completely condemned because you're basically relying on a supernatural power that's not God. You're believing in like your own yeah. power and you're trying to control the supernatural world and the spiritual world, and that is messed up. And if you use Ouija boards and stuff to contact your relatives, you're not contacting your relatives. You're likely contacting demons that are pretending to be your relatives. And it's just you really don't want to get into that stuff. That's really like dangerous for your soul, and uh, it's it's strictly forbidden and condemned by the church. What were you going to say, Panza? Oh, well, I was actually, I, I was going to kind of add on to what you just said about like, you know, not, not essentially trusting your own facilities to interpret what you're understanding. Um, I think if you were to encounter, um, um, uh, you know, a, a soul, 
uh, in this state, there, there's kind of two principles to keep in mind. First of all, um, rely solely on the church. You know, if, if, if your priest or someone told you, you know, don't listen to what you heard or something like that, take that advice uh, uh, as if it is, it is spoken from the Lord himself, because like, the worst kind of thing that we can do is rely on our own faculties. Cause as St. John Henry Newman says, like mysticism or like trying to make, you know, up our like spiritual collage or whatever is the easiest way to find ourselves outside the church. And I think these kind of apparitions could be a gateway drug into that happening. Uh, not only, not only that principle holds, but also the principle of, um, really Igna- Ignatius is discernment of spirits, but instead of the discernment of spirits usually is, is applied to like you and, and, and hearing God's voice, but also understanding the situation and saying, okay, is this situation trying to pull me away from God or pull me towards God? For instance, if it's someone, uh, departed soul saying, you know, please pray for me. Well, clearly, uh, it's easy to know that prayer is a good thing and that, you, you know, yeah, you should pray for the soul. But if the departed soul says, you know, something funky like, you know, jump off your roof so that, you know, you can talk to me or something like that, you clearly know that that's a, a demonic activity and that's meant to hurt or harm you. So you take it. Yeah, go ahead. Keep talking. Yeah, keep talking. I see Dawson's in there too, but go ahead. Yeah, keep talking. <laughs> CT? Yeah. Oh, CT's uh, muted. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, but sorry. needless to uh, say... I didn't really have anything else to say to that. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. Um, you know, what's very interesting about about ghosts is I would ask the question, have y'all ever ha- heard any stories of the ghost of a saint appearing? I can think of one, but I wanted to hear from CT or Spec. So have you guys heard... Um, uh, stories of any uh, ghosts of saints like appearing to people. I mean, there's so been saint what I've apparitions. Heard, what I've heard, um, I've actually in studying for this a little bit, uh, I saw that St. Thomas himself actually had some encounters with, uh, I guess you could call them ghosts. <laughs> one of his, uh, one of his uh, brethren in the, in the monastery, I guess, who, who um, he didn't know had died. Um, but appeared to him and, and asked for prayers. And St. Thomas thought he was just showing up. <laughs> like he, he didn't think he was dead. Um, so he says, yeah, yeah, of course I'll pray for you. Uh, but he found out that he had actually died beforehand. So that's probably why St. Thomas was willing <laughs> to uh, part ways with Augustine somewhat on, uh, on the issue. But that's, that's what I can think of. I heard uh, from when I was watching, uh, I think, uh, Father Mike Smith's told a story, not about a saint, but about somebody who was likely in purgatory, where uh, these nuns at a, mon- a monastery or a nunnery, whatever it's called, um, they uh, there was like rattling all the time in this like one room of the of the nunnery, and um, only one nun had the key, but the person, the nun that had the key, passed away, and so all of a sudden, like the room, they kept hearing noises in the room, and then like they finally got into the room, and there was stuff all over. They cleaned it up, they locked it back up again it happened or whatever and uh so the nun went to the priest and said that this was happening and they said well how long has this been happening and she said oh like 80 years or something there's been stuff about going on in this room and they were like but why are you saying this now she's like oh well now it's getting really bad and they were like well is anything happening in the nunnery that's going on now and she's like oh well we're actually knocking the whole building down and long story short they determined that it was probably the nun from 80 years ago who passed away that was trying to get the other nuns attentions to ask her to pray for her in purgatory and so what they ended up doing was they had like a 30 day uh, vigil or something like that where every day for 30 days straight they had the entire parish and all the nuns and priests or whatever come together to pray for this nun soul and eventually all the rumblings and stuff stopped or whatever so that, I thought that was a very yeah. uh, interesting story um, I also wanted to ask though uh, like the apparitions there's that- actually another one though like that I find interesting I, I think Pine Sap's question was has a saint appeared as in, in, in that kind of a context Yes, um, and and yeah, actually, I, I just thought it's, again, say Thomas Aquinas. There's this story of this abortionist, um, this Russian abortionist, I think, uh, and you know, after having slaughtered hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, infants, um, he he actually so he had no idea that St. Thomas Aquinas even existed, so he didn't even know who this was in, in a vision. Um, but he had this vision of, of this man in a habit, of course, a Dominican habit. And behind him, I think in this meadow, and behind him 
was was like this whole field full of babies <laughs> that are kind of like giving him the dirty look like I, I was using these are babies that he had slaughtered in this vision and um, saint thomas is, is kind of tasked with saying that hey you have to turn your life around um and the story is that saint thomas is kind of atoning for his theological error that he made about the immaculate conception uh, whether or not you think he really you know what you know whatever that's kind of on the side but but the, the notion is that like he um, because he holds held to this philosophical position of delayed animation, um, in, in the process of, uh, of, um, gestation, you know, the, the notion that the soul is infused a subsequent to fertilization, uh, the Aristotelian view, um, he's, he's kind of atoning for that by appearing to this abortionist and the, the abortionist ended up becoming a, a Christian and, uh, turning his life around. So that's, that's actually a true story. Um, so okay. yeah, I think that fits. What All right, you're now saying. let me, let me put a <laughs> pen in it real sec. Um, I, I know they wanted me to ask about Our Lady of Fatima, uh, which I actually visited uh, uh, back in May. The uh, the complex there. Uh, I see Dawson's here for a second, uh, kind of double booked, but I wanted to get you a, a chance to say something about Cozy Dot TV, uh, and then we'll pick right back up where we left off with the with the exorcism and Catholic view on ghosts and stuff like that. Uh, but real quick, what's up, man? Hey, dude. Y'all ever looked at uh, non-monotheistic cultures and their ghost creatures like Skinwalkers and Rokunokubi, things like that? Uh, it's interesting. Yeah, actually, like, ghosts in Japan are very different. Like, objects become ghosts, like umbrella ghosts and stuff like that. Really? Yeah, I don't think they're in purgatory. If you want something really scary, go to Spurgatory. It's on Telegram. <laughs> it's the worst, of the, the worst of the worst battling it out. But yeah, it's just, I'm interested in just listening to this. I, I don't want to hijack it, but if you want to cover like ghosts outside of Christianity and like Native American stories and stuff, I can do that later. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. If you want to jump in later. I got a great about... skinwalker story like the. I don't know if you know the show Unsolved Mysteries. <laughs> But they yeah. actually came to our island and with like <laughs> all this equipment and stuff to to study the paranormal in this area near the core tree is an old Indian burial ground that people built over top of and this guy died in a basement. I'll tell you the story later. But they, they like quarantine this place off, so whatever they found even spooked the government. Well, I can come and tell you that later. Yeah, come back in here in a little while, definitely, uh, and jump back in and talk about it. I know you want to yeah, talk I'll about I'll be listening. Yeah. I'll be listening. I got a baby to stroll around anyway, so I'm yeah, that's trying cool. to get him to sleep, and then uh, I'll tell uh, the core tree story. That'll work out great, man. My brother, my brother tells ghost stories like <laughs> to tourists all summer, like professionally. So I'll try to like uh oh, wow. tell some of his too. Like okay. Good ones. Yeah. Yeah, man. Call back in here in a little cool. while. Ryan Dawson, thank you, brother. Cool. All right. We'll we'll talk to Ryan again uh here in a bit. Uh all right, go ahead, gentlemen. It's, Sorry uh, that I, I just it's, it's not surprising that uh, non monotheistic ghost uh, stories appear so um uh in, 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 in such wildly irrational manifestations because, you know, I, I would argue that those cultures are already quite infested with demons anyway. <laughs> yeah, I, but, bro, uh, I was th like, literally when he said like, not uh, like any religion other than Catholicism, I was like, yeah, demons. those are for sure demons. Like those are demonic apparitions. <laughs> Yeah, we believe all that like pagan gods and like fake deities like that. They're even all if demons. they're not though, like there's a, there's even a way that like the Catholic view can account for. I should say, um, okay, like, here's what I'll say: a Catholic is not restricted necessarily. I mean, I don't believe this, but a Catholic is not restricted necessarily to the view that there are only angels, demons, and men. Um, like uh, there's this book called Demoniality by Father Father Sinistrari, and he makes the case. And there are actually some church fathers that he's able to quote that a Catholic could believe in some um, like entities that are not exactly uh, reducible to the angelic, um, nor to men as descended from Adam, but. Uh, whether we're talking about um, like liminal beings, um, like what have you, that are you could say endowed with some form of rationality and animality, but are not necessarily uh, descended from Adam. I, I'm not committed to saying necessarily the church utterly rejects that. You'd have to 
work that within our existing theological framework. But uh, just just to say that, like, if if, if somebody like genuinely believes in um, various other uh, entities that, that that don't necessarily have a like, they, they don't fit comfortably in uh, what we're familiar with as Catholics, uh, that doesn't really necessarily undermine the faith or anything. I have a question for you guys, because uh, Ethan was just asking about it, and I was going to ask about this too, such as with Our Lady of Fatima and other Marian apparitions where Mary appears to certain people. Now, are these apparitions, would would they be considered ghosts because it's the spirit of Mary, or how would we view that? Is that like a... Uh, well, no, because Mary's embodied. Yeah, so right. the notion of a ghost is is like a soul that is still without its body, but nevertheless manifests its presence. Oh, because of, because of the uh, the because she assumed body yeah. and soul up in the heaven. Yeah. Okay, got yeah. you. So it's it, it's very similar to actually I'd argue it's like the same like when Jesus appears to someone where it's like Jesus isn't like a right. ghost like like it is yeah. it is just and that's Jesus what it says appearing. in the scripture where where the you know, the apostles think they see a ghost. Yeah. But the reason it's not is because he has the real body. He has his real body that's united to his soul. And, and the body that his soul um, uh, has always been uh, united to, it's the same body. And it's a similar case with Mary. So yeah, no Marian apparitions are ghosts. Um, it's a totally different category. What about the uh, the transfiguration uh, where they saw Moses with uh, Christ and stuff? Would, uh, would Moses and who, who else was there? Elijah, Elijah, right? So were they were they ghosts or was that something else? Um, I, I, if you want to, you can probably use the same basic category. You know, I, I don't see it. I mean, you you can use. I mean, if you want to use the word ghost, you can. But I mean, again, what you alluded to, it's really just a German for spirits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, I would say they're spirits. You know. Right. Okay. The, yeah. So know, if, the, the if we're going by the Catholic the terminology, of Elijah. Okay. yeah. I, to me, ghosts in the Catholic view is kind of leaning more on the soul in purgatory or the soul from hell warning someone to not join them there. Um, yeah. Like there's been stories of like uh, of souls from hell, God permitting that soul to appear to someone to warn them about if they live an unrepentant life, like what, what will befall them. Um, there's actually a very freaky story. I, I think... I think uh, you guys both have probably heard this story before, but th it was said that there was a very like vir uh, virtuous, in quotations, professor um, at this one like seminary or something. And he was a priest, and when he died, like they were having like a, a funeral for him, and as they were like proceeding, like like him uh, him in his open casket and stuff like that. Um, there was some part of the prayer where it like asked him like like where is your soul or like or like what are your sins or something like that and the body animates and he gets up he unclenches his mouth and he says i've been con i've been condemned to eternal fire because i've i've like withheld my sins and i i like basically lied my entire life and then the body falls back down and everyone's super freaked out wow <laughs> yeah that's crazy but uh, we we wouldn't believe in like I don't know like uh, haunted houses or like oh, like you know that movie uh, was it Annabelle where the doll doll is like haunted and stuff like that like that would be going more onto like possession or something right like that like uh, we don't believe that like a, a ghost can be haunting a house and like make bad things happen or something right like the Annabelle well, horror house ways in which like like if a soul is I mean it would have to think be communicated in a clearer way and actually conveying the notion of prayer mm -hmm. but like. Um, Pleas for help could make use of of material objects. I think, you know. Hmm. But again, you know, and demons so, too. I feel, yeah, I feel want... like I feel like yeah. Well, I think most likely, I think overwhelmingly, that's the result of the of the demonic because it is mm -hmm. kind of it's 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 outside the scope of reason. You know, it's just not a rational. Um, thing to do asking for someone to pray for you is a rational thing to do and that's the work of the spirit but mm -hmm. but they're not uh, just the there to like the, scare you the work of the irrational is, is 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 the work of the demonic maybe this would be a good segue to talk about the demonic absolutely actually. yeah and and exorcism so um i, 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 I guess start that off a little bit all right go ahead. yeah you can start I, I think talking about like it's important to kind of get a sense of what the Catholic Church views about demons? What is what is their purpose? Or why 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 are they the way they are? Why are they caught in this 
and in, in, in this immovable malice. And I think just to, it's important to kind of just talk about the order of creation first. Um, you most people when they read the first chapter of Genesis when it says God says let there be light, they think of the physical manifestation of light. But in reality, Augustine's interpretation is actually the, the creation of the angels, because God after that makes the sun and the stars in the narrative. So if he's making the sun and the stars after he makes light, how does that make sense if light refers to the physical manifestation of light? It makes more sense, as for Augustine, to believe that let there be light is a reference to, is, is, is a reference to the uh, spiritual lights of the angels. Because after that, it says, and God separated the light from the darkness. He never calls the darkness good, by the way. That's the only thing he doesn't call good in, in, in the narrative. Um, he doesn't call the darkness good. So the darkness in this sense, or whereas he would call it good if it were the physical, uh, if it were like the physical absence of physical light, because that's not evil. Um, where, but, he, but he doesn't call the darkness good. And so this is, Augustine thinks that this is kind of a reference to the fall of the uh, angels from from. Uh, the angelic choirs who were obedient to God. Um, and I think it's important to recognize, you know, what the, the, um, the demons fell um, because, so originally God created the angels in order that the angels would govern the material cosmos in a way that would keep all things in, in harmony around the worship and praise of God. Um, and there are some angels before they were, you know, given the beatific vision, they were given this choice. Are they going to, uh, you know, sign up for this uh, order of, of the cosmos or not? They chose not to because they wanted, uh, because they didn't want to govern over the material cosmos in order that the material cosmos can uh, harmoniously revolve around the praise and worship of God. They wanted to rule over the material cosmos for their own self glorification. So you know, pride and subsubsequently envy is is uh, it, it ensues from 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 the fall of the demons. Um, and interestingly enough, Adam was created in order to replace Lucifer as the uh, as the means whereby the spiritual can bring the material into that right alignment that I spoke of. Um, and of course, when Adam fails, the the, the divine word himself simply takes on uh, that role and even more and even infinitely more so so it's like it, it, it's not just uh, the highest spiritual creature moving the material cosmos into uh, right aligned with god it is god himself manifest fully in jesus christ um but so the demons they of course didn't want to submit themselves to this divinely instituted order of creation um, and so their mission as a result of that is they, they, they're, in, they're laser focused on this end that um, God's chosen way of bringing the material cosmos and, and, and all the rest of creation into alignment with himself uh, through Christ and his saints, um, that, that, that their goal is to frustrate that. Uh, because that was uh, the reason for which they rebelled. They didn't want to submit to that whole program. They didn't want to submit to that whole order of creation. So they exist. Th their purpose is to obfuscate that, to frustrate that, to to to, to make it unrealizable for for as many human souls as possible. They want to prevent as many human souls from participating in uh, in in. in in the coming together of the material cosmos and the divinity in Christ. Uh, so that's why possession exists. Possession exists. They, they take on uh, human uh, bodies for that end. So I just want to kind of lay that out because it's important to understand uh, why, uh, why the Catholic Church says what it says about demons. Um, in order to understand demonic possession, we have to understand the purpose for which it exists on the part of the demons. So just wanted to give that framework. 
Cool. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll just read off the uh, the bullet points that I took, the notes that I was of going over these like lectures on exorcism and stuff like that. Um, and then I'll let Pine Sap, uh, how, whatever you want to say. So, um, so the idea of possession by demons or evil spirits is as old as recorded history um, and spans multiple different cultures. It, it's not just limited to Catholicism. Like there's stories going back as far as time talking about people being possessed by something, some type of evil uh, spirits or something. Um, in Catholicism, exorcisms are a sacramental as opposed to a sacrament, which is a material object or action ritually blessed by a priest to signal its association with the sacraments. Um, exorcism is used to, uh, for those believed to be possessed by demons in order to drive them out. Demonic possession is when Satan or lesser demons engage in spiritual attacks against someone where they take control over certain aspects of their body or mind, or uh, they try to cause them physical or psychological harm. Um, possession in Catholicism, this is something I didn't know, This uh, possession in Catholicism takes six different forms, ranging from complete control by demons to voluntary submission to demons. The first is possession, where a demon takes full control of a person's body without their consent and is usually brought on by the person's actions that made them more susceptible to Satan's influence. So if you're messing with, like we were talking about before, if you're messing around with like Ouija boards or seances or you're doing something that's like trying to contact evil spirits or something like that, you're harming your soul by making yourself more open and susceptible to uh, possession. Um, the second is obsession, which includes uh, sudden attacks of irrational and obsessive thoughts, generally believed to be Satan trying to get someone to commit suicide. So uh, they'll make you obsessed with crazy thoughts that you can't get out of your head, like those intrusive thoughts that we've talked about uh, before, um, where you're just totally hyper-focused on something, and you, no matter what you do, you can't get out, and it's to drive the person crazy and, and try to make them kill themselves. The third is oppression, where there is no loss of consciousness or involuntary action, but Satan torments a person by causing material misfortune in their life, um, which I don't know much about that. I'm guessing that's like, uh, what we're we talking about, like maybe they try to make their house appear haunted and psychologically damage them. I'm not really sure about that one. Uh, yeah, I mean, four- that happened to Padre Pio, for example. Mm, okay. Yeah, Padre Pio actually talked a lot about like uh, Satan messing with them and stuff. Um, mm-hmm. The fourth is uh, Satan causing external physical pain, um, where I think they showed this in like movies like The Exorcist and stuff like that, where like cuts appear on people's bodies and stuff like that. Um, The fifth is infestation, which affects objects or houses or animals and stuff. So I'm guessing that's like making animals or objects in your house act weird or like send things flying across the room and stuff like that to mess with you. Um, And the sixth is uh, subjects in which a, um, a person voluntarily submits and welcomes in Satan's or demons. So that's people that like are willing to like Satanists that are willing to like work for Satan or be possessed by Satan, sacrifice themselves for Satan. Um, The four most typical characteristics of true demonic uh, possession are supernatural strength, speaking in languages the person never knew, revelation of knowledge that the person had no way of knowing, and blasphemous rage, obscenity, profanity, and aversion to holy objects. Obviously, if anybody's familiar with exorcism movies in general, you know that the people are cursing, they're speaking languages, like Latin, like there's a, a very yeah. famous um, exorcism with the tapes and stuff like that, where the, the the little girl was who had no way of knowing Latin was speaking fluent Latin to the priest. Right? It's insane. It's really really scary stuff. Um, Emily also, Rose. Yeah. Right. And also, uh, just want to like throw this out here for people. Like, if like if this stuff like scares you and like you know like you're open to that stuff, like don't don't risk your soul by like looking into this stuff. You know, like it's not worth it. Like, there's no you, you, there's nothing you need to know about like exorcism and stuff like that that's that you need for salvation you know like so like if, don't don't if I could just say mm-hmm. the best way to avoid uh entanglement with any of this is just to avoid mortal sin because mm-hmm. yep. that is that is the number one pathway that's the number mm-hmm. one pathway and and it could happen to anybody you know the, the number one pathway to and to inviting the demonic into one's life is mortal sin so mm-hmm. you know if, if you if you're thinking that you know it might be a lot more convenient to do this thing that's mortally sinful than to bear the sacrifice of not doing that thing. Well, mm-hmm. uh, you might want to think again because you know nobody who gets demonically possessed um, necessarily expects it to happen. Uh, well, you know, some people might, but most of them don't. You know, and it it's often is triggered by just op- opening up the invitation through sin. Mm-hmm you have complete control of preventing anything like that from happening by just abiding in the commandments of Christ and uh, cultivating the virtues and avoiding the vices. So true. And like uh, ghosts, while well, ghosts are theologically up for debate and stuff like that, but demons are real. We believe in demons. They are right. real. Yeah. They are attacking us. Yeah. And yeah, so <laughs> we believe in demons, but we don't have to fear them as like we said, as long as we have Jesus Christ. Uh, I was watching this priest. And by the he way, said, um, 
like it's it's not it's not so insane like or it's not so unreasonable look um it's i think everybody would admit it is very very highly controversial like even in academia to say that uh the mind is reducible to the brain like that's that's a very controversial thing to say even in like high places in academia so if that's true then it shouldn't be that much of a stretch to say that it's reasonable to believe that you know, if if the mind is not reducible to the brain, and I think there are arguments to definitively prove that's the case, but uh, um, but but if it can at least be conceded that it's reasonable to believe that, then it's also reasonable to believe that well, then there could be pure minds that are not embodied. It actually makes sense, you know. In every other order of creation, we have uh, th- that 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 strata of being existing in itself. So, like we have. Uh, like pure minerals we have pure uh vegetative plant life uh we have pure animals right and we have when and we have and then we have this weird hybrid that's us of, of uh animal and rational so why can't we just have rational so i just wanted to say that like mm-hmm. some people listening might be of a more secular mindset but it's really not that unreasonable mm-hmm. Um, uh, Pinesap, I have more points, but I'll let you talk. If you want to jump in there, say whatever you want to say. Oh yeah. I will, um, to give a personal story about, uh, I, by the way, classical theists, uh, advice about just avoiding moral sin completely to not invite the demonic in your life is entirely correct. Everyone should listen and retain that from that, this stream, but to oh, add Pinesap, on, is your, is your, is your mic on your, uh, video camera again, or is it on your blue Yeti? Um, it should be should be okay. this one All right. is it weird or it was a little bit for a second but i think it's fine go ahead oh, okay um so really I, I i had someone once ask me um because there was this uh this book called the dictionary uh infernal uh i'm probably mispronouncing the french but it, it went something along the lines of that um and it's like a, a dictionary of demons it's like demonology 101 and it was written by a french priest and I had this person ask me, do, uh, do you think that I could like read this and study this and stuff like that? And, and I, I told them no, um, because that kind of curiosity is a morbid curiosity. So it's not a curiosity that prompts the heart towards God and, and closer to God and to holy objects. But when we're curious in things that are wrong for us or evil for us, it only leads us further down a path of evil. You know, I know YouTube's very popular and kind of showing off this stuff and, and it's showing it to us as kind of like an enticing subject to look into. But when we look into it, it can really be the way that we in, uh, invite the demonic into our lives. And thus, what I will um, say, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, 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 and I said thus, it's just better to avoid it in general, but go ahead, CT. What I will say, if you're secular-minded, it might not be a bad idea to look into it, because I think it, it has actually has a, a bit of compelling uh, empirical evidence that that can do, it can sometimes do more for mm-hmm. people to convince them of um, that, spiritual things than... That's kind of what happened What happened to me. That was that was one of, that's not like the main thing. Like I was looking into like the Shroud of Toron and uh, the lecture by the actual Protestant um, apologist, uh, Lee Strobel, The Case for Christ. These are all like things that helped me come to believe in Christ. But one of the things was that possession audio of like this yeah. little girl speaking Latin, right? And I was, and she had no yeah, way, there was no, no way of her that. knowing, right? Yeah. And like that started making me think like, okay, there's something yeah. supernatural going on here, you know? Well, I mean, um, here's the thing, like an atheist, if you're an atheist, then you have to believe that every single claim to the paranormal, every single claim to the preternatural, every single claim to... Um, some sort of intangible reality breaking through the physical cosmos is false and either rooted in lies or hallucination. You have to believe that every single claim is falsified. Whereas for us, we don't have to believe in any of these. Um, we don't have to believe in any miracle apart from what's recorded in divine revelation. And and, and our faith would still be rooted in reason and not an argument. And uh, so it was, we, we lose no sleep over whether like this exorcism is true or, or rather this case of demonic possession are true or that one is, is true. It doesn't matter for us, but for an atheist, like you have to believe that every single one of them is false. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, also that's 
a good segue is like in the Catholic Church, exorcisms must be permitted by bishops, and they go uh, under a very long and strenuous process to figure out if the person is truly um, demonically possessed. Like they make sure that they cancel out any type of uh, mental illness or anything like that. They're examined by numerous people before an exorcism is uh, granted permission. Now, of course, we have bad clergy or whatever that might do them without the consent of the of the Catholic Church and stuff like that. But in order for an official uh, exorcism to be carried out by the Catholic Church, it needs to go through a very strenuous uh, process. And it's also um, good to note that exorcism is not magic. It is uh, what, what it's doing. It's, it's a prayer, basically, and it's invoking the authority of Jesus Christ, yeah. which demons are required to respond and submit to. And also, actually, I want to ask you, either Pinesap or Classical Deus, there's like this... Um, I've heard it a bunch of times where it's like, oh, uh, demons are required to tell the truth to the priests when they're doing the exorcism or whatever. I heard that's not actually like a, a dogmatic thing that that's true. I would actually say there's very, very, very little that's dogmatic when it comes to like what's true about demonic possession. And, and you know, it's, it's honestly, a lot of it seems to be kind of like trial and error, to be honest. There's, there's not a lot that the church has, the church's magisterium has taught about like what demons can do, what they're not allowed to do in the case of possession. So really, I think it's all... I think, I think you know, if you talk to exorcists, they're really, I think, uh, you got to get the sense that so much of what, what they say about it is a result of, like, trial and error. It's actually kind of the most empirical uh, branches of uh, clerical work that we have, you know? It, it, it's, it's one of those, it's, like, an, an exorcist, if he's going to be successful, he kind of just has to work in the field to see what works and what doesn't work. Of course, within the bounds of divine revelation and the magisterium, but because I, I would just say I don't think there's really much that, that is dogmatic about it. Yeah, and um, also, I didn't know this too, that uh, apparently up until the Middle Ages, I think it was, let me look at my notes, 1614, there was no like specific official guidelines on how to perform an exorcism in yeah. the Catholic Church, yeah, um, which, which I thought was weird. That, yeah. But, but apparently why they had to make these guidelines was because, like, people were using, like, lay people and not even, like, clergy or whatever were doing these exorcisms that were using, like, condemned techniques like magic and, like, other uh, bad things or whatever. So they had to come up with these um, these guidelines that were in place from 1614 to 1999, and then they changed, like, the parameters or whatever of exorcism. But that's very odd to me that it took so long to come up with these guidelines. Why, why do you think that is? Do you think that, like, it just wasn't a very common thing or something? Um, I think, um, you know, it's similar to the liturgy, you know, the, the liturgy, there was a lot more freedom in terms of liturgical experimentation up until the Council of Trent, mm -hmm. uh, when uh, there was kind of a decision to codify um, and, and restrict liturgical directives to the Holy See. Um, and I think it's, it's kind of a... After the Council of Trent, I think you had this much greater centralization of ecclesiastical authority uh, as, you know, to, to be uh, wholly residing within the Holy See. Um, mm -hmm. so, so it might just be because of, uh, I think the church rightly came to her senses a little bit and recognized that, okay, a lot of this stuff, a lot of these spiritual uh, practices um, have to be uh, kind of reined in a little bit. You know, for example, like exorcism is not a sacrament. So mm -hmm. it, 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 it's, it's, kind of, it, it's kind of more of a sacramental kind of thing than a sacrament. So there was maybe less of a, less of a reason to uh, restrict it too, too heavily. Um, but yeah, I, th I think that's just kind of an era in which the church was beginning to centralize a lot of these various uh, practices and subject them to greater regulation. Mm -hmm. Got you. Anything you want to add, Pants up? No, I, I, I think CT covered all of it. <laughs> now, do you um, think? Oh, go ahead. Oh no, go right ahead. No, no, I, wa I wanted you to talk if you have something, but I'll, if you don't have anything, I'll continue. <laughs> oh no, that that was a verbalized pause, not a. <laughs> Oh, all right. Um, so I want to ask, uh, we know that God only permits evil so that greater things could come from it, right? So why what do you think, or is there any theological basis for this? Why would God allow demons to possess and hurt people? 
Well, I think that um, in a lot of cases, um, the person who's possessed by a demon, even if they happen, you know, to die, they, they, I, I, I think in in a lot of cases, you know, God provides opportunities for that person to either uh, repent or or they or they they might even be it. Um, it's nothing that someone who's possessed, um, nothing they do in that state is is culpably done by definition, right? So, um, so I think it's it's not so much a question of what that what evil is done to the person who's possessed, because if you're talking about spiritual evil, there's really not much spiritual evil that's done to the person who's possessed in the state of possession, because they're kind of not able to sin in that state. Um, I think it, it's, it's more of a question of why does God permit it? Uh, well, what reasons might there be for God allowing this to happen for our sake? And I think um, the first of all, the existence of demonic possession is a great witness to uh, the invisible realities of this world that I think, it, especially in our day and age, uh, secular-minded people need to uh, need to be exposed to. Um, secondly, I think it's um, it, you know, whenever there's an, whenever there's a case of demonic possession, we're always exposed. our minds our minds always rush to uh, the exorcism, and the exorcism is kind of a constant witness that the church has. Hold on, Wooza, Wooza is in, came in here and his mic is like going crazy. Okay. All right, let me. Ethan, can you, uh, yeah, can yeah. You use, yeah, let me let me mute him there. Go ahead. Yeah. No, sorry. Yeah, I was just saying that. You know. The, the, the fact that exorcisms happen, I think, is a constant witness to the church's um, uh, possession of Christ's authority on earth. I, you know, it's, it's – even in secular culture, it's – whenever the demonic is brought up, there's always in, in the shadow of that the presence of the Catholic church, you know, through a priest, through the exorcism. And that's always on the minds of everybody, pretty much. Whenever people think of the demonic, they, they think of the Catholic Church because they think of the Catholic Church as the remedy for the demonic and exorcism. So I think mm -hmm. demonic possession is, is actually a great witness to the truth of the Catholic faith. That might be a reason why God permits it. Yeah, yeah, that, that's actually true. Every movie that you see that involves exorcism, it's always Catholics, right? It's never they're never going to like a Baptist black church or something like that. And asking, yeah, I mean, uh, and believe me, they try to do exorcisms, but mm -hmm. it just looks very uh, funky and stupid. Yeah, and I like the uh, th those uh, those Protestants or whatever, where like they speak tongues and they think that like they're, they're going up on the yeah, and they're having they like 20, doing, 20 uh, exorcisms uh, or whatever, yeah. and they just like start <laughs> shaking or whatever and doing break dancing or something. It's, yeah. it's either fate or the person that that I would say is a level of um, uh, the placebo effect, like the person believes they're possessed. And so they, you know, will go up and act like it and really give a show. But there's no actual power in, in either the possession yeah. or. I know it's not to yeah. say that it's not to say that like a Protestant. A Protestant's prayer cannot deliver somebody of demonic possession. Like, but sure, but but that prayer is not necessarily authoritative. Um, right. it, that's just you know God might choose to answer it. Mm -hmm. Right, and I would also say too that like possession and all this stuff are just like direct things that Satan and demons do to people, but that demonic activity is happening all around us especially in this country these abortionists these people even if they're claiming to be atheist or secular type people or whatever if they're promoting these things that are antithetical to the word of god they are influenced by satan even if it's just yeah. indirect well that's what that's what the scriptures say that anyone who is opposed to christ is antichrist mm -hmm. so true so true what are uh some uh like What's what, what? What is like the most famous uh, exorcist? Because I, I didn't get into that stuff when I was doing the research or whatever. I know about that one Probably little girl that Amorous. I mentioned. Probably uh, Amorous. What's it? What, uh, Father, Father Amorous. Oh, what, what happened with that? Yeah, so Father Amorous is kind of like he, uh, he's he for a while was I think the most famous exorcist. 
Mm-hmm. Oh no, I meant like exorcism story, like uh, like. Oh, I thought you said the exorcist. Okay. I, I probably did, but I meant like exorcism story, like um, I all the, the ones I know about are Emily Rose, which I know because there was a movie made about it, and then I know I don't remember the little girl's name, but the one that basically helped bring me to Catholicism was the girl speaking Latin. So, are there any other uh, famous exorcisms like that? CT muted himself again. I don't know if he did that on purpose. Go ahead, oh. CT. Uh, I think he is muted. Let's see. The most yeah, famous I mean, I, one. I, oh, there he is. I there don't is. have any oh. on that. I don't have any off the top. Okay. Of my head. okay. This isn't something like I, I was more here to talk about like the theology behind demons and stuff. I don't really have too many uh, yeah. concrete stories. I mean, the most famous exorcism I can think of is the one of Emily Rose in Germany. Um, and that one was, I, I mean, uh, to everyone, like if you listen to the tapes from that one and the, and the, uh, excerpts and stuff like that, it is insane. The kinds of things that like those demons are saying and stuff like that, like weirdly like prophetic things and like very specific or odd, um, like statements and stuff like that. And I, I, I mean, like, I remember the demons say like, we love when uh, religious like uh, don't attend to their uh, like duties and like pray the divine office, but they'll like watch TV or do something else. Wow. Like yeah, one of the examples. So her name, uh, Emily Rose was the fake name that they gave for the movie. Her real name was Annalise uh, Mitchell. Um, and she actually passed away during the exorcism apparently. And that was like the big, uh, the big thing. Like they tried, like I said, they tried psychiatric treatment. They tried like trying to make sure that she wasn't like just mentally ill or something along those lines. And, uh, they ruled everything out. They called the family to have an exorcism and uh, they tried to perform an exorcism, uh, 67 times it says, which that's insane. She was only 23 years old and, uh, she refused to eat. She was speaking, I guess, Latin, um, and she ended up passing away because she didn't eat. She was only 66 pounds. That's insane. That's yeah. scary. So that's stuff. one of those rare instances in which it actually can result in a death. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, but that's not uh, – normally exorcisms wouldn't – that wouldn't happen, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I, the, the, as far as I know, in the overwhelmingly vast majority of cases, God does not permit that to happen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's, but yeah, that does seem to be the most like famous one and stuff. But um, yeah, well, I guess you, if you want to go into like the theology more about like uh, about demons and stuff like that, like I, I, what I know is that there's like seven different types of demons, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't really have too much more to add about that. I think we're we're probably a little over our time. I don't know, but um, but yeah, I mean, I kind of just wanted to say that it's just really important when you're thinking about these things. Um, always to think about them um, sort of within, within the broader framework of um, what God actually wants you to do in your life. <laughs> you should never think about demons for the sake of thinking about demons. You should never think about exorcisms or possessions for the sake of those things in themselves. You should always just think about them as um, – and then as, as opportunities to clean your own life up, because if, as, as Pinecep was, or as uh, Spexo was saying, um, yeah, it is true that, you know, demons love it when we fall into just very seemingly innocuous uh, spiritual sloth, you know, things that aren't even necessarily sins in themselves, but nevertheless put us on the wrong track, you know, put us on a trajectory that is ever so slightly leading us away from God, where we're either moving toward or away from God. There really is no action that can be classified as truly morally indifferent. It's either in some way incrementally towards or incrementally away from God. Um, And, you you know, it it can be, you know, uh, towards him in a very mundane way, like even just like... um, not doing anything sometimes can be moving towards God because you're not in in any way uh, uh, diverting your spiritual uh, focus away from Him. You know, you're just living your mundane life in a way that's keeping the commandments. You know, you know that that's that's good. But uh, we should always strive to avoid spiritual sloth. We should we should always strive to avoid um, uh, situations that clutter up the mind and 
in so doing, divert our attention away from God, because that is an opportunity in which the demonic can enter into our lives, even if it's not in a flashy uh, demonic obsession or possession or anything like that. It is, uh, I think, actually, their most powerful weapon is um, just keeping our minds um, obfuscated and um, and uh, and and unable to see clearly. Uh, what we ought to do in order to stay on the path of uh, salvation. So I just hope that whatever we talked about today, however, uh, uh, however well it was presented, I, I just want that to be kind of the takeaway, you know? Um, yeah, before I'll let Pine Sap finish it out, but yeah, everything you said was absolutely true. But apparently uh, Black Swan is saying that the girl we were just talking about, Annalise, who was possessed, she broke her possession. And then uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to her and asked her if she would um, be possessed so that souls could be saved. So she basically sacrificed herself and she's actually a victim and apparently a saint, according yeah. to Black Swan. That's yeah, and cool. you know, that's, that's another instance in which I think that gets to your question earlier about why God permits that. These can be very powerful witnesses to the truth of the faith and it can be witnesses to god's love and mercy as well you know about how these souls are sometimes delivered from uh the scourge and end up you know uh getting becoming closer and closer to god as, as a result of those trials so yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. pines up anything you want to uh, add i'm trying to think um yeah i mean the biggest the biggest thing with uh I guess I could kind of, kind of brief, just briefly cover it. Like the biggest thing is if you, if you don't want to be possessed, right? You don't want to uh, uh, have any demonic influence in your life. Um, you know, frequent sacramentals. Uh, the the biggest thing I recommend is the Saint Benedict Medal and the Miraculous Medal of Mary. You know, um, if you do that and keep those, uh, if you have those and you have those sacramentals on you. Um, that, that's a great protection against demonic influence, not to mention, um, father Chad Ripperger has his little book of deliverance prayers that can be said by laity, um, that are just short little prayers that ward off, uh, demonic influence, yeah. you know, re restate our he's baptismal excellent vows. Uh, he's excellent. Absolutely. And, um, those prayers I, I found a lot of healing from. Um, I think I prayed actually in the back of that one. I prayed uh, the entire one uh, to ward off the influences of uh, generational spirits from Freemasonry because unfortunately some of my family members had been Freemasons. And I remember that my friend um, who's being received in the church had to do the same for uh, uh, being formerly Mormon since they had the connection to uh, Freemasons and stuff like that. So he said those prayers. And it was really beautiful. Um, I think I think that those prayers are, are are so efficacious, and so they'll protect you from demonic influence. Yeah, yeah. Also, what I did too is I had my priest come and bless my house too, because <laughs> I was just let's uh, go. I had him go. He just did, he went he went around sprayed holy water everywhere, so I feel like extra safe now in my in my house. No demonic possession. <laughs> But um, yeah, uh, I think that's that basically wraps it up. Ethan, did you have any questions? Uh, not really. I was just sitting here listening uh, and enjoying my uh, enjoying myself. I think the audience was as well. Uh, a little presentation here. We're gonna do some ghost stories next. So I think it kind of. Uh, oh, thanks for thanks into, for having us on, Ethan. Yeah, yeah. man. Thanks for coming yeah, by, absolutely. and I appreciate it. Thanks Thank you. We never uh, talked, but thanks for having me on, brother. I appreciate yeah. it. I'm very humbled by this. Oh yeah, 100. percent uh, One year in the books, Cozy TV. Thank you guys for oh, contributing yeah. to this program. It's a cozy itself, uh, and I hope to talk to you all soon. Absolutely. Thanks again. God bless. Yeah, God bless. Happy anniversary, cozy. God bless. You you. Have a good God one. bless. Very cool.